I have a sermon I want to preach, and it's called, it's a series we're beginning today. It's called Kingdom Keys to Walking in the Spirit. And today I want to talk about intentional belief. I want to talk about how we deliberately make a choice. The truth is, we live in a world like everybody else. Religion is a wonderful thing and also a terrible curse at the same time. And there are many people who believe that uh, religion is an important part, an aspect of my life, and so I, am, I exist over here, and then I apply some sort of a religious set, system of rules to my life. That makes me a better person. And much uh, of Christianity is like that. Well, I'm just going to apply a set of external rules uh, to my life and try and obey them. And, and the effort of trying to obey them makes me a better person. And that's what really actually what God is after. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is not interested in getting you into some sort of religious system and some sort of a, uh, a, a practice of uh, natural obedience. God is interested in revolutionizing your life. God is interested in putting your old self to death, creating a brand new you and launching you into this world empowered by the Holy Spirit. God is not interested in you being a more moral person person, although morality is beautiful and right, and you should be, God is interested in you being a reflection of who Jesus is. He wants people to see Jesus in you. It's not enough that you just do good works. God wants to demonstrate His Son through your life. Hello. you like... If there is no difference between me and the next door neighbor who happens to be an atheist, if we think the same, operate the same, work the same, are motivated by the same ways, then there is no value to our religion. The fundamental truth is that when Jesus Christ takes up residence inside of you, you cannot stay the same. You have become new. Behold, the old is gone, and a brand new you is alive. Everything is changed. Everything is revolutionized. And somehow, in the church, it's become acceptable. It's become more than acceptable. It's become normative for us to walk as those who have no faith. To use the same weaponry, the same effort, the same tools that they use, we use. But I'm here to tell you, if that's all we do, if that's all we accomplish, then we have severely missed the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God does not rely on the same things that people do. Jesus, in fact, said to his disciples, you, you have in mind the things of God, of men and not of God. When he rebuked Peter, he said, he called him Satan. He goes, get behind me, Satan, because you have in mind the things of men, not the things of heaven. Now, you and I are called to be those kind of people who function not just in this natural realm, but who function from the Spirit. We hear things that heaven invades our hearts first and then through us invades this earth. We are supposed to be the people who hear from heaven, see from a different perspective, have a completely different mindset, whose internal values have been revolutionized because we've been born again. We are the people who function on a very different plane. And because we're informed from heaven, because we are moved by unseen realities, that we function on this earth very, very, very differently to our atheistic neighbors. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Now, I want to take you to a scripture in Hebrews 11, because it just, it just ministered to me this week, uh, earlier, right earlier in the week, and I was reading this. And so I want to read this to you about Noah. It says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Let me take you through that just very briefly. A little piece, when he was warned about things not yet seen. Noah was warned by God that it's going to rain, and this valley that you're looking out over halfway up the mountain, God said, I want you to build an ark, and Noah started building an ark that was 140 meters long, which is like, it's like, it's like one a football field and another third of a football field long, and about 40% of a football field wide and three stories high. Build it. And he said, why? He said, because 
you look out over this valley. He goes, yeah, I'm going to flood this whole thing with even the mountaintops. It's going to be underwater. That had never been seen. He was living in an arid region. There had never been a flood. And God speaks to him about something that is coming because of the wrath of God. He said, no, I want you to build an ark. And Noah, because he believed, started to build. Noah got up and was informed not by what he could see. The Bible says, when warned about things not yet seen. I want to ask you a question. Can God speak, you about, speak to you about things that you don't yet see? Or when he speaks to you about things that do not exist, do, do, do you clamp down so much on what you've heard and you go, no, no, I can't see it now. I can't taste it now. I can't touch it now. It can't be true. See, if we're going to be people who, who function in the realm of the Spirit, then we have to learn to hear about things that we don't yet see. We have to hear the messages of God, and we have to believe things that we don't yet take into account. Because if you're going to function in the Spirit, you have to learn to suspend and make sub secondary, subsidized to the Word of God what you currently experience, what you currently see, your current set of circumstances, and your history to date. All of that must be subservient to what I heard from God. If Noah did not have the capacity, when God said to him, Noah, look across this valley, yep, it's going to be underwater. And the Bible says, when warned about things not yet seen, Noah said, wow, that's going to be astounding. The deliberate suspension of what we currently see is appropriated when ev evaluating what we believe we've heard from God. The moment I, when I hear from God and I make what I've heard from God subject to what I currently see, I diminish what I've heard from God and I, and I, I, I diminish my own reality to an existence that is what my neighbor who doesn't know God is, is limited to. I have severely hampered and limited my life to only experiencing what I can accomplish. But if I can lift my heart, and when I can learn to hear uh, and learn to see things that are not yet seen because I heard it from God, I'm elevated into this brand new world of possibility. It says, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. There are some values that God has which we will do well to understand. Holy fear means that we esteem his value system above our own. Noah could have, Noah could have said, God said, I'm going I'm to destroy the earth. Noah could have gone, you know, God's mean. That's just wrong. I mean, he's not, I know, that's just, oh, that's just bad. And the moment I've discovered in my life when the Lord speaks and I begin to, to apply my own personal value system on top of, well, I don't like what God said. I, I don't like his choice of the person he's deciding to use. I don't like what he said. I don't like his timing. I, I don't think that's appropriate. I, I, I think that's not good. How many of you know the Lord goes, oh, oh, no, well, then I won't do it, Greg. <laughs> so sorry to have offended you. No, he doesn't do that. Like, son, son, get on my page. Get on my page. And people get all knotted up. And you know what the Bible says? The nations rage and they make plans and they strive against the Lord and against his anointed one. But God sits in heaven and he laughs. Because it's foolishness. He goes like, no, what are you doing? Well, I, I just, I just not going to go with that. Okay. Hope you can tread water. Our obedience to the, what the Lord has said is our protection. Because it says, by that faith, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. Do you know that there are some things that if you can hear them and you respond to what you've heard in God, not only brings benefit to you, but to people around you. People who depend on you will be saved because you believed. That's for a few people in this place. By faith, he condemned the world. Oh, I like this one. Uh, th this is for about half of the church will understand this, but that's okay. In holy fear, the Bible says, by faith, he condemned the world. Understand this. In, in the earth at that time, there existed rebellion against the 
the principles of God, the world was utterly given over to evil all the time. Is what the scripture says. There was no one but Noah on the earth who actually even cared about good. Everybody was just out for violence, bloodshed, take whatever they want. It was a brutal, violent place. And God said, I'm done with this. And, but that existed up until the time God found a believer. Because the moment God said, I'm going to flood the earth, and Noah said, yes, from that second onwards, the world was condemned. By his faith, he condemned the world. There are some things that the enemy has been building up in our nation and in this world for millennia that God is it's non-issue to God because he just has to find you, one of us who believes what he's saying. And by that faith, you condemn what has taken millennia to build by the enemy. You, by your faith in God, can destroy an existence. Because up until that time, that was the only reality that existed. But when Noah believed God, he condemned that reality. And a new reality, a new possibility was born in God, which became the reality of everybody on the earth. Are you understanding this? When you believe, when you dare to believe what God says to you, not only can you save you and your family, but you condemn what the enemy has been trying to establish. And he became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Faith is the currency of inheritance. Honor is the primary vehicle of inheritance, and faith is the currency by which we purchase. Righteousness and faith are forever linked in God. He became heir of the righteousness that is by faith. That's in the covenant of Noah. It's in the covenant of Abraham. It's in the covenant of David. It's in the new covenant. Righteousness and faith are linked. If you believe God, you're considered righteous. Righteousness is crude into your account when you believe on what Jesus did on the cross. That's how righteousness comes. Righteousness and faith are forever connected in the kingdom. Uh, people and religion tends to say righteousness and my works are forever connected, but that's not true. Religion has caused a lot of damage in this world. So Abraham, somewhere between 55 and 75 years is, so Abraham, Noah, is, is <laughs> and Noah built the ark. Yeah, so somewhere between 55 and 75 years, Noah is building the ark. And he, he brings his three sons in. I think from the time they, were, they could carry logs or use a saw, he got, come, buddy, you gotta help me. And so they are building. Now, here's what I want to just think about. Uh, at some stage, I pretty much guarantee you that Noah's wife called him aside and said, listen, buddy, it's been 20 years. You're building a monstrosity on the side of the mount. People are mocking me in the marketplace. Are you sure this is what God told you to do? I mean, how sure are you? Do you think the daughters-in-law didn't say to their husbands, honey, do you think your dad is sane? Do you think he's all there? It's been 50 years now. You guys are building this monstrosity. How are we going to get the animals in there? Seriously. And, and this valley is going to be full of water? We're in, a, we're in a drought right now. You think at some stage there wasn't a little pushback? You think the, the people in the world who were always only given over always to evil weren't mocking him constantly? I want to talk about people who start to obey God because there's an unseen reality, not in a singular moment, but for years, decades. I walk in a place of obedience because I saw something in God. I'm not talking about the flash obedience, the one-time event when God speaks to you and you do it and poof, there's, there's instant blessing on your life. You go, oh, that's wonderful. I remember when, when my daughter was young, then because you're teaching them, you say, do this, and then they do it and you give them a reward and they get candy or something and they go, oh, that's wonderful. And then they do something profound and you give them a reward. And they take two steps and you stand and applaud. But when they're 12 and they take two steps, you don't applaud. Oh, that's amazing. It's like, Dad, you're embarrassing me. (laughs) 
And I've discovered in my life that when I was a young baby Christian, the Lord would give me something to do, I'd do it, and there'd be instant gratification, instant favor on it. He'd like reward me for that step of obedience. And I'd go, oh, man, God and I like this. And then as I got older, he'd say, I want you to do that, and I'd do it, and then I'd wait for the applause, and he'd go, no, so good, now, now do this. Okay, but, but, and Jesus told the parable, you should say we are unworthy servants because all we've done is our duty. Remember that one? No, no, Greg, I don't want to hear that parable. I want to hear the one about, <laughs> as, as you grow older, as I've grown older, the Lord has called me to do some things which I've seen from heaven, which don't have an instant grat gratification, doesn't have instant reward, but I'm walking out decades into the walking out of the obedience of the thing that I heard from heaven, and, and, I, and it hasn't started raining yet. Do you know what happened to Noah? It didn't rain one drop until he finished the ark, until the animals went in. Noah walked himself up the ramp, and the Bible says God closed the door himself. And shut them in. And when that happened, the first drop of rain started falling. And there are some things that God has called you to if you're a mature believer. And if you're somebody who wants to walk in the Spirit, there are some things that the Holy Spirit is calling you to and He's wooing you to and you feel it. Every time you get quiet, you know this call of God. You know the direction He's calling you into. And it requires not just momentary obedience. It requires long-term walking in the way of the Lord. And the day is coming when, when it's all wrapped up and you step into your ark and the rain will start falling and then suddenly you'll see, wow, then you're the hero. Until then, you're just a madman on the mountain. You can hear things from heaven. You can see unseen things if you'll open up your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, talk to me about stuff I don't yet know. Explain to me things that I've never heard. Open my eyes to see things I've never seen. I'm gonna choose to believe you. I'm gonna choose to put my faith in that. I'm gonna choose to trust that. And it is a choice. The key to today's sermon is that there is a place for you and me to make a deliberate choice about where we place our trust. Most people don't make this choice. Most people just trust in what they can see, hear, taste, see, and smell. That's what I trust. I trust myself. I trust my own senses. I trust my own judgment. But I've made a decision long ago, and I'm inviting you to make the same one today, that we have to make a decision about where we put our trust, what we choose to believe. We are motivated and moved by unseen realities. We are moved and motivated by unseen realities. This is what Jesus said in John 3. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from, where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You can stand outside, see the effect of the wind, feel the power of the wind, but not knowing what caused it. You can't see the wind except if it's blowing something. You can see the effects of the wind. And so it is with those who are born of the Spirit. Unseen forces move you. People will see the kingdom's effect on you, but they cannot see the kingdom. We are moved and motivated by unseen forces. What's the difference between me and my atheist neighbor is that he cannot experience the wind of the Spirit and I'm consistently blown back and forth by it. Hebrews 11 says in the Young's literal, now faith is of things hoped for, a confidence. Of matters not seen, a conviction. The voice says it nicer. Faith is the assurance of things that you hope for, the absolute conviction that there are realities that you've never seen. It is this movement by unseen forces, the power of the kingdom moving through our lives that enables us to walk in some of the things that Jesus said, this is the way I want you to walk. It, it's the only way you can explain some of these things, to praise God in hardships or dark days, to serve everyone in order to become great, to give thanks in every circumstance, to rejoice when you're persecuted for His name, to bless those who curse you, to give away when you are in need, 
to consider others above yourself, and to humble yourself in order to be exalted. You can't function in the kingdom without being moved internally by the Spirit. Because if you want to step into the kingdom and not be moved by the Spirit, but to act in the natural, you start to curse those who curse you. And when you're in a lack, you don't give anything. You hoard as much as you can. And if you want to be great, you protect your reputation at all costs. Does it make sense? We're not called to walk in the flesh. You weren't called to walk as mere men, as Paul says. You're called to a new and a more, more beautiful way. And it is available for every one of us. And it comes by choice. Paul said, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory which far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. The eternal always wins. So the key is to direct your trust. Let's talk a little bit about directing, deliberately directing where you put your trust. It's a key. Some of David's Psalms, this, uh, I, I, could, I, could, I could do this all day. But I just put up five, I think, or six. That's, we, didn't, we just got to Psalm 16, and that's just David. Blessed are those who put their trust in you. Put your trust in the Lord. They put their trust in you. I will put my trust. Uh, those who know your name will put their trust in you. In the Lord, I put my trust. For in you, I put my trust. There is a deliberate action behind that. David keeps saying, listen, I'm in the middle of terrible times. I'm in the middle of severe beasts. I have people on every side that want to take me down. The circumstances of my life are not great, but I put my trust by deliberate action. At one stage, he even says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. There is a, a, a real clear focus. Because a subtle, nuanced whisper of the enemy is, hey, uh, God is not good. God is not going to come through. God doesn't care about you. It's all up to you. It's all on you. It's all about what you can do. Don't you dare trust anybody else. Be a self-made person. Don't rely on the Lord. Listen only to your own heart. And do as much as you can do, because in the end, it's all on you. So the same tone. When Sennacherib, the, the king of the Assyrians, came against Jerusalem, he cried out to everybody and he said, Do not let Hezekiah tell you to put your trust in the Lord. He says, the gods of no other nation have saved them, and your God will not save you from my hand. And that night, 185,000 people of their troops were killed with one angel. While he's limping away, he says, don't think that your God saved you. Okay, what do you, what do you think happened? You know, Jesus died. I'm just, I'm just giving you some sense of this in Scripture. Now, Thomas called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's a choice. He's standing in front of people who had been weeping with him just hours earlier. They are fully excited, shiny-eyed. Thomas, Jesus showed up. He goes, I will not believe that. Until I do it, until I, my experience, my hand in his side, me touching him, me seeing it with my own eyes, when I see that, then I'll believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side. Stop doubting. And believe. That's a command, by the way. Thomas, come here. Put your hand. Stop it. 
Stop it, Thomas. Blessed are you because your eyes see what you see and your ears hear what you've heard. But blessed more, rather blessed, more greatly blessed are those who believe and they have not seen and they have not touched. That's what Jesus said. You want to limit what you allow yourself to believe by your own personal experience. You want to walk in the Spirit? You want, to, you want to take quantum leaps in the Spirit? Learn to suspend your own thing and say, Lord, take me on a journey. I'm going to just dare to believe you. I put my trust in you. You can take quantum steps. You can just skip years of nonsense. Sign me up, Lord, for that part. But you know what? You can't say, I will not believe until I experience it personally. As though my perception is the ultimate decider on whether God is real or not. Because, as you all know, you and I know everything there is to know about everything. No, we have no ability, very, very tiny, limited ability to discern. The only thing we have is to say, Lord, I'm choosing to put my trust in you. So what do I trust? Well, firstly, you trust his name. That's who he is. That's his nature. In, in the scripture, when God revealed himself, this is the understanding of the, of the progressive revelations of God. Whenever God cut a covenant and revealed himself to somebody, he, 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 he revealed to them a, a name that was associated with it. In the culture of the day, when they would ask, what is your name? They would say, what is the name? What is the, the nature by which you are called? What do people say about you? It's like, what is the rating that, that 10,000 people have given you? What do they say? What name do they call you by? And so when God said, this is my name, people understood that's who he is. That's his nature. Because your name and your nature were, were connected in the Scriptures. So when God reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh, the one who has gone ahead to provide for you, he's demonstrating something of who he is. God who is your peace. The God who is your healing. The God who is a banner who watches over you. These are the names of God. And so many, many times in Scripture, and I'll just put up a few again. There, there are, we can prove this again and again. But there are some of these things where, where the psalmist and other people say, uh, Isaiah says, I will put my trust in your name. I love this one in, in Isaiah 50. Let the one who walks in the dark and who has no light trust in the name of the Lord. I'm stuck. I'm under pressure. I don't know what's going on. I feel like the whole world's weight is on me. I can't hear the voice of God. I'm in the dark. I don't know what to do. Trust in the nature of God. What step should I take? What's, what does God say? He's going to be loving and faithful and providing for you. Yeah, we'll take that step. But I can't see anything. Well, when I have no light... I'm going to put my trust in the name of the Lord. You said you're going to be the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. I'm going to trust that. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. I'm going to trust that. You said you would be faithful to me forever. I'll trust that. You said you'd never be angry with me again. I'll trust that. What do you know about God? There are going to come moments in your life when it's going to feel like even the Lord has abandoned you. Circumstances are brutal. Life is tough. Nobody's celebrating you. Everybody's hating on you. It is not happy days. It's dark days. It's horrible days. And in the worst days of our life like that, in the worst moments of my life, when I've stood in abject brokenness and nothing is going right for me, and I've stood there and known the next step defines the rest of my life, and standing in that dark place and weeping those tears, knowing in my heart, I don't understand what's going on, but this I know, my God is loving and my God is faithful. And I can't tell you how I know that, 
but I know that. And so I'm taking that step. When I'm in the darkness, I trust the name of the Lord. I trust his nature. This is why it is such an incredible crime when the church preaches the wrong nature of God. Secondly, trust his word. What he says and what he promises. Again, we could fill the screens of scriptures. God, I trust in your word. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises. <laughs> do you know that he's the God who calls the things that do not exist as though they do? Which means that when you first hear them, he says, this is what is. And you go, no, it's not. That's what he's called. The God who calls the things that are not as though they were. This is what exists. You go, no, uh, seriously, it doesn't. But just like Noah, when he declares it and you believe it, from the moment that conception takes place, a believing heart and his spoken word brings forth a reality that did not exist before that moment of time. I swear this to you. There are some future realities that God wants to bring, he wants to conceive in your heart right now when he speaks to you. And if you'll dare to make a choice, I'm gonna trust what God says. And you know why I'm, I'm making such a fuss of this? Because you have to declare it before it happens. Noah didn't just get the word from the Lord and then it started raining. Now Noah had to go out for 75 years and work and sweat he had, to carry, he had to cut down trees. Some of the trees he used at the end of the project, he planted at the beginning of the project. He went out and planted a few acres of oak trees because he needed to build an ark. So there were 75-year-old trees. He go, go cut down those trees we planted. Now bring them because we need the third floor. And then the, and then the Lord said he had to align it with pitch on the outside and on the inside. Three stories high, football, more than a football field long. He had to go get pitched from somewhere and then paint it on. How many more months are we going to be putting pitch, Dad? I smell like pitch. My wife sleeps with a peg on her nose. Yeah, son, we're going to do this thing. He's trustworthy in all his promises, and I'm stepping forward on the promise. I'm executing on what God said. And sometimes it's going to be instant gratification and you're going to see the fruit of your labor in the same day and praise God for those moments. I bless you. But if it takes 20 years or 30 years or 50 years or 75 years of steadfast obedience according to the word of the Lord, I promise you, I swear this to you, not one of those people will go without their reward because on such people the kingdom is built. And we're talking about kingdom keys to walking in the Spirit. If you want to be somebody who walks in the realm of the Holy Spirit, then you have to make a decision about what you're going to believe. It is a key. So I want to ask you, would you dare to join me and make a decision for your life this year? I'm choosing to put my trust by deliberate decision in who I know God is and I'm deciding to put my trust in what he says. Of first importance, above anything else, because who he is is an unlimited possibility for me and what he says can ignite new futures. I'd like to close in prayer, and I'm going to pray that prayer. Join me. And let's come together as a people who say, Lord, we're going to be that kind of person. We're going to be that kind of people that when you speak, even though we don't see it yet, we'll start to obey. We'll start to show the commensurate works that go along with that faith. We'll step out in the direction of what you've called us to. We'll go, and we don't need anything else. Father, in Jesus' name, we come together as a church and we ask, Father, that you would make a way for us to walk into this new year and see 
unbelievable and incredible things. Things, Lord, that we could not ever have imagined or attained in our own strength. Take us, Lord, way beyond the bounds of natural religion. Take us into the realm of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you took a ragtag team of 120 people and you changed the world in a generation, the world in a generation, because they were people who dared to follow your Holy Spirit. Lord, we have billions of people who call on your name and very little change taking place in the world. Lord, there is a problem that we face. It is the fight of faith. And you ask Jesus, when the Son of Man comes back, is he going to find any faith on the earth? Lord, I ask that you would make of this place and of these people a household of faith. Lord, our cry would be, yes, please. Let it be us, Lord. And so, Lord, by deliberate choice right now, I choose to believe who you are and what you say. I will put my trust in you. Above what I can see, above what I know, above what I experience, I put my trust in you. And as David said, and so I am helped. Give us a year, Lord, that is astounding. Quantum leaps of progress. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen and amen. Very cool.